Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nurse Linda uh, Professional Webinar. We are very fortunate today. It's Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to introduce myself. Um, I am a lightly pigmented woman with brown hair. I wear clear glasses, and I am sitting in front of a navy blue background, and I have a green sweater on, so it's kind of hard to distinguish that green and blue, so I apologize for that. I won't wear it again in my webinars. But um, ironically, we have a question from an audience member who says, hey, could we hear from somebody who's rep representing some of the uh, things at the VA? And by golly, how about that? Question answered. Today, we have a very special guest who's from the VA Boston Healthcare System. And I must give full disclosure. First of all, we know each other. We serve on the Academy of Spinal Cord Injury Research Committee, and the, our guest now is the chairman of that committee. So he's a, a researcher, a neurologist, a spinal cord injury specialist, and also um, I want to say, and I'm going to embarrass him right up front, but I want to say he is the future of paralysis research. So we are really fortunate today to have Dr. Rafer Willenberg. And welcome, Dr. Willenberg. Would you like to uh, describe yourself to the audience? Sure, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I am also lightly pigmented. I wear glasses on this presentation. I have a silver bow tie in front of a background that's a bridge over water. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Willenberg, how on earth did you get interested in research in paralysis? It's always, well, it's always a good connection for the audience. Everybody wants to know, what motivates you to do this? What makes you tick? The cop-out answer would be, some people are just born that way. But okay. really, um, I think it was, I was probably in preschool. Before even knowing what the words for brain and spinal cord were, I was interested in that. Um, and if you think of the brain being the control system of the body, and the, the spinal cord is the, the conduit and relay system from the brain to the body and body back to the brain. Um, having a lesion, you know, the size of maybe your thumbnail that can interrupt the signals from brain to body and body to brain. And the people who have spinal cord injury, sometimes there's a stereotype that it can be someone who has no other medical conditions. They just have spinal cord injury. And I can imagine myself being in that situation, seeing my legs that are still attached to my body and the legs should work, but I can't control them. So there's a concept of the problem. There's the puzzle to solve and the people who make up this patient population are all what intrigue and, and energize me, energize to, me to, to work on spinal cord injury. Well, I have to say, I love your response because I get it because I'm I'm the same way. So it's, it's like spinal cord injury and paralysis is like the most fascinating of all the healthcare systems and how things work in my book. So it sounds like we're on the same page there. Um, so let me get ask you a quick question here for to kick us off. Um, could you talk, you're a researcher, you're a scientist, you're a medical doctor, so you've got the you got the whole uh, panacea covered here, um, which is wonderful to be able to intertwine all of that. So could you tell us a bit about how research is conducted and used by scientists and healthcare professionals from animal to people and how all that works? Sure. Um, I anticipated you might be asking me a question about this, so I actually prepared a slide. Um, let me see if I can share that here. Um, maybe this will work. And did I do that correctly? You can see one slide. We are right on target. Great. OK, so rephrasing what you're asking me, I'm going to break it down into what I think are two questions. Um, I think what you're asking is, what is translational research? 
and how are animals used in research? And in thinking of translational research, the an easy concept to describe this is having a bench to bedside approach. So you might have a researcher such as a doctor or a scientist have an idea for something that they think might be an intervention for a patient with a condition. So they have this idea, they test it in a laboratory, and the goal is to get that intervention to a patient. So it's a, it's a forward thinking approach. And that approach going bench to bedside models how we do clinical trials. Um, as shown with this diagram on the right, we start with uh, preclinical data, advancing then to phase one of a clinical trial, uh, which is the big theme here in phase one is safety. Phase two, advancing with a theme largely of efficacy. Stage three, with a theme really of dosing and comparison. Uh, so what dose can be efficacious for this medicine and how does it, this treatment compare to other treatments available? Sometimes this leads to FDA approval and then there can be a stage four of clinical trials, clinical trials which is uh, monitoring for long-term, long-term monitoring for adverse effects. So with this thinking forward, it's a very one trajectory progression going preclinical to phase one, two, three, et cetera. Um, a difference between the bench to bedside approach and the advancement of clinical trials is that with translational medicine, there's also a bedside to bench approach. So at any stage, there might be an aha moment where an idea that you, a researcher, learns from observing patients in any stages of clinical trials or at the bedside, so to speak, that idea could come back to the laboratory or some prior stage in the process and keep advancing in the process again. So translational medicine goes both ways. Now your question of where do animals fit into this and what are the role of animals, they are really part of that preclinical stage. And there are two big roles for animals in research to put, to put things in, in simple thinking. One is for discovery, and one is for pre-human testing. So for discovery, let's say there's an idea that there may be a mechanism or a pathway uh, physiologic pathway that may warrant trying to do something about it, such as with a drug. But we don't have a drug yet. We don't even know what it is that we want to target. So one approach might be such as to do a genetic screen to look for genes that might be involved in some pathway that we then want to manipulate to develop an intervention that's going to go to humans. So this is how the role of fruit flies can come up for developing clinical interventions. Clearly, the fruit, fruit fly is not really closely related to humans, but it can help to identify genes involved or pathways involved that warrant targeting. And then what should be very uh, logical is we use animals for pre-human testing. Um, as you can see with these clinical trials, the numbers of people for each stage increase more and more and more, going from single digits or tens to hundreds to thousands. So before taking an idea that may have clinical benefit, we want to do our best to ensure that there is potential benefit to gain that's better than the anticipated risk and really iron things out in animals before we advance to humans. And if I left anything unclear, please let me know. No, I think that was a wonderful explanation. I, there is a question though about um, people who wanna get involved in clinical trials. And you work at the VA, so you have a different system than people who do not work in the VA system. Could you talk about how people can get involved. We always have a lot of individuals 
who are looking for some kind of treatment. They're looking for something. They're willing to participate. And how would you get involved in a clinical trial? Both. Oh, look at look at you. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought you might ask me about this question too. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't even know this one was coming, but as a maybe, I prepared this slide. So I work in the VA system. I also dabble outside the VA system. And so I have a little bit of exposure here and there. And there are different types of studies in each system. So in the VA system, it's typically the patient or subject population ends up being veterans, people who are already tied into the VA system itself. Outside the VA system, it's usually unrestricted or not restricted to veterans or non-veterans. Um, for finding out what clinical trials exist and what people can participate in, the main database is clinicaltrials.gov. Um, but there have been additional databases that glean information from clinicaltrials.gov to try to be more user-friendly and easier for people in the community to use. Two of these examples are sci-trialsfinder.net, which is the first link I put on the slide here, and the second is sci-trials.org. Um, I've tinkered around with each of these just a little bit, and what's nice about both of these two uh, user-friendly approaches is that they have what seem to be search options that are more catered to people who have SCI or spinal cord injuries and disorders, which is SCI slash D. And these two trials finders and the SCITrials.org, they include a paragraph in simple terms for many of these trials of what the trial is. So I encourage people to check out these two uh, curated sites for clinical trials if they're interested in learning more or discovering what would be um, easier for them to participate in. I do want to mention that these clinical trials, um, some of them you have to go to the site and some of them they might send you a questionnaire or you might be able to glean some information and talk to your doctor about something that might help you. So if you, if you find a trial that's not in your area and you can't get to that place to participate, you can still get the information from that trial. Do they have the information? I know on clinicaltrials.gov, they'll put up a report about a study. Do they do that in the other two sites as well? Um, I haven't tinkered around with it enough to look up that information. So I, I can't speak with authority on what's there. Um, as for the reputation of both of these sites, both of them are sponsored by different uh, agencies associated with spinal cord injury. And I know the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation sponsors uh, sci-trials.org. And thank you for that plug. We always appreciate it. So following up with that, once you find a clinical trial, or maybe you just, you just want data, you want to know what's going on, what's new out there. So that's where databases come in. So can you mm -hmm. talk us talk to us about databases, literature reviews? How would people from the community find information about what is going on in research? Yeah. Um, so in trying to dive in to databases about research and research publications themselves, a starting point is what is your own comfort level in interpreting this data? Um, that's one point to consider. And it's going to be a little bit different for someone in the community versus someone who is already a medical doctor versus someone who is specifically a researcher. Um, but for some background, I think a starting point for anyone would be what are the resources you already have available? Meaning, what are the databases that you can get access to? Um, some common databases include PubMed, or the Cochrane Library, or Web of Science, or Embase. Um, I know that PubMed, you can access whether you're at an institution or public library or your home. But the subscriptions to journals that are accessible through these databases 
uh, vary on which institution you're trying to access them through. So some journals have uh, open access that anyone with or without out with or without a subscription can access, but many journals have uh, subscription requirements. Um, and so the locations where you can get access to these things include places like academic hospitals. Sometimes there will be a library that the lay public or community can access, or um, your public library, or if you have access to um, an institution like some type of university, uh, university library, they will have their own subscriptions and uh, access to articles that you can get. That said, um, so I'm going to start with talking about PubMed because that's what I use most commonly and am most familiar with. If you were to go and you want to learn about spinal cord injury, so you enter a search spinal cord injury into PubMed, it will yield over 90,000 results. 90,000. Uh, that is too much reading for any human to try to uh, proceed through. So obviously you would want to uh, um, narrow down your search. But also, in addition to narrowing down your search, let's say you want to look at spinal cord injury and hypothermia and see if that's even something plausible to try to chase down or what research has been done with that. It is easy. There are different levels of data for articles that are published, different article types. And as that starting point, let me review some of those for these different types of clinical research reports. Um, and I mentioned this because in PubMed in particular, there are filters and you can filter out the type of reports that you're looking for. And so I'm just going to review, and there are over 50 types of filters, but they have some common themes as to the types of reports you might be looking at. So one type of report is what's called this case report or case series. This is generally a report from one patient, that's a case report, or a series of patients being a case series. And essentially, this will often be something like a doctor observed something interesting in a patient, and wrote up this report of that patient or a series of patients. So you can think of these almost like anecdotal stories. One level of uh, report above that of stronger data is an observational study or a cohort study. An example of this could be looking at all the individuals who had a spinal cord injury in 2017 resulting in paraplegia and observing this cohort of people in the next five years to evaluate their incidence of stroke and then comparing incidence of stroke for those with tetraplegia in that group to a control group. Um, that is a sort of dual cohort study. That is some of the research that I do and that type of research is looking at correlations. So one type of research report that's a level above that with even stronger data is the randomized clinical trial. This is our gold standard for getting scientific data. And in this case, this would be the, the textbook example is a clinical trial of having one intervention or a medication of and then one um, placebo group. And patients or subjects are randomized to either get that intervention or to get a placebo. Um, so this is an approach that's used to try to take out bias that could be um, part of the study. And it's getting closer to causation as an effect rather than correlation. So it's trying to get to more of the gold nuggets of real knowledge. From the randomized clinical trial, a level of data above that is the uh, systematic review. Any type of review, but a systematic review is uh, preferred. And this typically will include randomized clinical trials, and it could include other trials as well. One of the best one of the types of reviews with the best reputation and the 
held to a high standard are the Cochrane reviews. And I put the link up here, www.cochrane.org. So these are reviews basically of the highest level. So when you are going through your database searching for type of clinical research reports, I encourage you to try looking for systematic reviews or reviews of any kind and filtering those out to try to get um, reports on data that is already synthesized and has additional perspectives. For doctors in particular, a level above the systematic reviews are society guidelines. Society guidelines such as the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, for instance, um, they take into account systematic reviews and randomized clinical trials to try to make guidelines for the doctors of that specialty for that society. Um, so doctors might use society guidelines and then also might choose systematic reviews. Uh, but one caution here is that these steps to get to these high uh, meta levels of analysis of, of reviews, they take time. So for a systematic review to occur, and it's based on clinical trials, the clinical trials have to already be done. So the systematic review might lag years behind, and the society guidelines might also lag further years behind. So if you're looking through society guidelines, they might be 10 years old, and there may be already new research that has come down the pipeline that are not reflected in those society guidelines. Any questions on that approach? Well, you know, I, I find it interesting because um, you mentioned PubMed and the Cochrane Reviews are all open to the public. And the wonderful thing about the Cochrane Reviews, which are very, very detailed, and very medically oriented, but they always have a, a summary for the uh, consumer, and which is very nice. So if you wanna read all the scientific work, well, that's great, but um, it's always nice to have that review page that you can just cut, cut to it very quickly. And then also um, I wanted to mention on the guidelines on the ReFoundation, if you turn in, if you uh, click into some of the different uh, issues that come with paralysis, like for instance, sepsis, there's a web page about sepsis. And if you scroll all the way down close to the end, there are clinical guideline links there that if you want to know what is what is the treatment for clinical guidelines, that will be the, the society guideline will be there um, just for you to click on. So that's a good resource to figure out you know, maybe if you have sepsis, you're probably more interested in quicker treatment than looking up the clinical guidelines. But the, but they are, there are some guidelines on some of those websites um, that we're putting in there as well. So that's that's a very um, easy way to get that. So that's that's kind of nice. We did have a question come in, but it, they've just asked if they could ask a question. So we'll we'll keep going, and maybe the question will pop up here in the chat box. Let me just um, touch base so, on what you just brought up, though. Um, so, right, for the Cochrane reviews, um, they do have a summary paragraph for each of the studies written in terms that are understandable to the community. So that is a really nice resource. I did not mention, but PubMed, um, they typically will have an abstract posted that you can at least read, even if you cannot access the entire article. And for society guidelines, um, Right. So one other aspect I wanted to mention about society guidelines is that they will include, they would typically include the strength of the recommendation based on what is coming in to make that guideline. So they could say like level one recommendation that you should not routinely treat patients with uh, steroids for acute spinal cord injury. Um, and level one is the strongest recommendation. And level two is a not a strong recommendation. Level three might be, well, by expert opinion, but we don't have randomized clinical trials to support this recommendation. Um, so society guidelines are nice in giving the strength of the recommendation for whatever the recommendation is. That's really nice. And I must say, too, the PVA has some wonderful guidelines. And if you go yes, on to the PVA, PVA website, fantastic. yes. And you want to talk about those just uh, briefly? Um, so the PVA has these uh, clinical guidelines that they made. 
Um, these are very long reports. Some of them are like 100 pages long. I think if you just sign up, you can get the guidelines for free. Um, there are summary sheets that maybe it's like a three page summary of the guidelines, uh, which are very digestible. Um, and so certainly for doctors, spinal cord injury specialists, uh, these are somewhat of the Bible of guidelines. Um, they're the yes, best they that are. we have thus far, generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, for caretakers, um, there could be interest in looking up these guidelines. Often in our own clinic, we have patients asking questions that then get funneled down the line and bounced between us as providers. And it results in us jumping back to the guidelines to figure out, well, what is the best level of evidence and recommendation for how to approach UTIs and using urinary catheters and trying to counter osteoporosis, et cetera. Well, you know, I'm a little bit different in my thinking and I agree with you 100%, but boy, I tell you, they're good reading. I never tire of them, <laughs> but you know, I am who I am. So, you know, I'm a lot of fun on a Saturday night. Right? <laughs> Let's read some guidelines. <laughs> but uh, the P PVA guidelines are quite wonderful. Um, so um, we need more people like you, Linda. Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of people like me, but we're small in number, but we're mighty. Okay. So I imagine you would probably do the same, Dr. Willenberg. We do enjoy our work. So a tremendous amount of work has been done. You've talked about the research and how we're doing all this research. And, and it just, people are working on a lot of different things that's, that really is making a lot of progress. So, um, one of the questions that frequently comes up is that people will ask, you know, you keep talking about this research and all this research being done. So the question is, we've had a lot of progress and we've had um, some setbacks. Can you talk about how research is progressing and are we making headway? What's, you know, what's going on with all of this? Why don't, why don't we have all the answers right now? That's a big question. I'll just that put it out That is a big there. question. I'm going to break out the answer into a handful of parts. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can I anticipated this question a bit, so I give it some more thought. There are three, three concepts that I can think of for answering this. One is ebb and flow of science. Two is uh, an issue with reproducing findings. And three is a need to proceed carefully. Uh, so I'll walk through each of these thoughts. Um, first, go, going really, really big picture, um, conceptually, before 1903, zero airplanes existed. 1903 was when the, the Wright brothers are um, credited with having the first flight with the Wright Flyer in North Carolina. In 1967, we have the fastest aircraft speed ever recorded of Mach 6.7 through some rocket powered plane that was a joint venture from the Air Force and NASA. And in 1974, uh, there was the SR-71 Blackbird that achieved a Mach of 3.2, and that's the fastest operational plane. So from 1903 to 1974, we have starting from zero airplane ever in existence to the fastest airplane ever in existence over the course of 71 years. Uh, we also put a man on the moon in 1969. From 1974 to now, there has been zero faster airplane. There's been no faster airplane than the one that we made in 1974. So that looks like we've had zero advancements in making faster airplanes in the last 50 years. But we had a 70 year span where and the first airplane was created to the fastest airplane ever created. So what happened? And I'm going to make one point that there's ebb and flow in science. Everything was coming together. There's a whole lot of advancement. And then after 1974, there's still advancement, but it's now different. Part of that difference comes from different pressures and different societal environments. So there can be interests change, interest of society, interest of the public, um, financial pressures change. 
And also these two things are intermixed with politics and who's in power for influencing funding and which projects have uh, more acceleration versus not. Acceleration, no pun intended. Um, so there's just ebb and flow, and there are pressures that affect the ebb and flow of science and advancement. But a second point that I was getting to was there's an aspect of how science works, and part of that ends up being this issue of reproducing findings. And to talk about that a little bit, um, as we showed before, maybe I'll jump back to that slide. Um, let me just go to it. So we have animal work that helps with preclinical data and that's used to advance treatments that eventually make it into humans or have the potential to make it to humans. Well, starting from animals, animals are not humans. So if we have a treatment that helps mice walk better after a spinal cord injury, um, mice walk on four limbs, whereas humans walk on two limbs. Mice are not the same as humans. There are physiological differences. There's a slight difference in neuroanatomy, neural wiring. There's these differences that make it not so surprising that not everything that worked in a mouse might work exactly the same way in a human. So that's one potential for why some scientific advancements in animals don't translate to fully coming to fruition in humans. Another point of a limitation in reproducing findings is that in scientific experiments, we typically set them up with rigidity and trying to have all parameters be consistent and having things as homogeneous as possible. Um, because we're trying to detect a difference, even if small. So for instance, and in including work that I've done um, with spinal cord injury and in with animal research, typically a spinal cord injury will be at the same level in every animal with the same mechanism, with the same force. And in a group of animals where they're all the same animal strain, even the same animal litter, they're all brothers and sisters. We are trying to get all the variables to not be varied, to be as consistent as possible, to then compare what happens with this group of animals who got this intervention, such as contrasting to control animals that did not get the intervention. Um, well, when you take that and you translate it to real life, real life is not homogeneous. And everyone's spinal cord injury is a little bit different. Um, when trying to do a clinical trial, it's anticipated that not everyone is going to have the same level of injury, not everyone's going to have the same mechanism of injury, and certainly not everyone's going to have the same severity of injury. Even within people who have a Asia A severity of injury, there can be variation, and certainly in the Asia Bs, Asia Cs, there are variations in what function people have on what deficits they have, etc. So if we start out with an effect in animals, the effect has to be robust enough that when you introduce variability in humans and variability in the real world, that effect still has to hold up. So the effect in animals, we're starting out with something that needs to be super robust, so to speak. And there, there are more. Third concept here is best thought of as a file drawer finding in, in context of challenging challenges of reproducing findings. So in science, we often use statistics to help determine whether there is an effect versus there was not effect. And there's just variability due to chance. And uh, the concept that's easy to illustrate here is we use something called a p-value and it's basically in simple terms saying that if we set a p-value to 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.05, it's basically we're getting at there's a 5% chance that the differences here were due to chance and 95% chance that the differences are not due to chance. So if you think of that, 
5% is one out of 20. And if you did that same experiment 20 times, one of those times you might get a difference due to chance and the others maybe didn't have that difference due to chance. And we're, if we're talking about a difference, that could be you have an intervention or a drug or mechanism, some type of intervention that leads to a chance that might have a clinical benefit, uh, leads to an outcome that might have a clinical benefit, excuse me. So in this concept of the pile drawer problem, the exciting studies and the ones that, that get attention and publicity are the ones that yield a positive outcome, a difference. When you have a study that, oh, you have your, your experimental group and your control group and there's no difference, it looks like the intervention didn't work, those don't get as much of attention and they might end up in the file drawer, never seeing the light of day. The issue here is that when the trials, the studies that have positive results get attention and the ones that didn't have positive results don't get attention, it looks like all these ones that got attention have some real positive outcome, but there's a possibility that the outcome was due to chance. So if you think about it, that one in, just for simplistic terms, if one in 20 studies had an outcome due to chance, it's not so surprising that sometimes these findings are not replicated with other labs or going advancing from animals to humans. And the last point, the fourth way that I'm going to illustrate that there's a challenge in reproducing findings is sometimes um, the setup of a scientific experiment has shortcomings that make it hard to interpret that something really had a real effect. It's more of an issue of if you start out with a, a study of just correlation, let's say an example is um, someone, there's a correlation of people eating mayonnaise sandwiches uh, just prior to having a spinal cord injury. Uh, there's mechanistically, I can't think of any reason why that would make any sense, um, but there may be that correlation. Um, and that correlation does not equal causation. There may be no real tie to the two other than, well, that happens to be an interesting coincidence. Um, so starting from coincidence and trying to go to a real effect, that, that's a big jump. And studies that have too much um, or overinterpretation of what is causation might lead to shortcomings in what our actual understanding is of what's going on. That was a lot of information to process through. And the third point that I'm going to talk about is a need to proceed carefully. And for this one, I'm going to integrate some of the other concepts we just talked about, but I think it's going to be easier to talk about it as a story. And this one I'm going to talk, introduce as calling it a, the P10 story. Um, so when I was in graduate school doing my PhD, uh, that was a little bit over a decade ago, um, this guy named Shigang He at Harvard, um, his lab had an idea to try to screen for genes that inhibit cell growth and try to figure out if there are genes that you could manipulate or knock out or delete to enhance regeneration following spinal cord injury. And the, the concept here is that in the spinal cord following injury, the axons, which are these projections from neurons, they really don't regenerate well. They do it pretty poorly. Some of the tracks, the specified, uh, having specified functions in the spinal cord, some of them regenerate worse than others. Um, so there's a big barrier for having the axons regenerate after they are injured with spinal cord injury. So in trying to manipulate some of these um, genes that restrict growth, these are anti-tumor genes or anti-cancer genes. If we can manipulate them, we can use a powerful approach to try to get regeneration. So Jigang He's lab, they did this genetic screen in rodents, actually, 
and they tested a, a handful of these anti-growth genes. And they found that one of these, in this case, it was P10, um, was promising for getting regrowth in the nervous system. And after a few experiments, then they tried it in the spinal cord and they got remarkable regeneration of these axons beyond and through a lesion. What I'm showing here is one of my own uh, illustrations that I made from research that I did in collaboration with Ji Geng He. And at the time I was in Oz Stewart lab, lab at uh, UC Irvine. He's director of the Reeve Irvine Research Center. And what I'm showing is on the left, uh, here's the rostral part of the spinal cord going toward the head. And all these rainbow colored fibers are axons. And here's the spinal cord lesion. And really cleanly illustrated is one axon that went through the lesion and made all these branches. Um, so it regenerated through the lesion and then had an elegant arbor of branches that may make connections to talk to other neurons. Um, so Zhigang He had the insight that there are issues in studies not being replicated so he got ahead of the curve and collaborated with other scientists, including Bin Hai Zhang at UCSD, and as I mentioned, Oz Stewart at UC Irvine. And in our own labs, we replicated the findings that Zhi Geng He was, was getting. And that instilled confidence in us that we are seeing a real phenomenon. This is not an experiment due to chance. This is not an outcome due to chance. Additionally, what we did in, in our lab was we identified that these axons that regenerated, they formed these structures called synapses um, that reflect that the axon, the neuron, could talk to adjacent neurons. So potentially signals could be going through the spinal cord injury when these signals were previously interrupted. So um, this was super exciting. This, we ended up making the cover of Nature Neuroscience. It was big flashy science. Uh, there were newspaper articles, et cetera. When I went to a conference and presented this, uh, one of my colleagues said, wow, he had presented our article at his own journal club. And his comment to me was, the goalposts had moved. Like this was a significant, remarkable advancement for the regeneration that we were able to get that had never been seen in this way before. Now, stepping back and thinking about this, what were we doing? We have this um, issue of regeneration not happening after spinal cord injury, and we messed around with anti-tumor genes, anti-cancer genes, to stimulate regeneration to go past the lesion. Well, anti-cancer genes, anti-tumor genes, deleting those sounds scary. And there was a concern that maybe this will result in tumors because we're now taking off the things that are stopping growth. And so tumors are, are a big concern. I didn't see tumors in my experiments, in my mice, and we didn't in um, others as well. But P10 in particular is mutated in some cancers. So there's a, a quote from Uncle Ben from Spider-Man that is actually a rephrasing of translations from the philosopher Voltaire. And that is, with great power comes great responsibility. Here we have identified an approach that has great power, great potential, but with it comes great responsibility. And so there's a need to proceed carefully. Um, as we're talking about deleting a can an anti-cancer gene in rodents, we probably would like to avoid deleting an anti-cancer gene in humans. And a better approach or a, a more palatable approach would be instead of deleting a gene to just silence it for a while or to knock it down for a while, something temporary. Those expense experiments were subsequently taken on um, and they were promising. Um, but as you can tell, that adds extra time, months, years, et cetera, in advancing science 
to continue along this advancement. We're also, we were using these novel technologies, novel techniques of using um, genetic manipulation by a viral vector. And this approach really hasn't been used much in humans. So there are additional layers for how much more vetting and how much more confidence that this is safe, additional layers of things that we would need to proceed through before advancing this into humans. Um, and also, you know, funding has changed over time, different things have shifted. So there is this super promising approach, um, almost, almost over a dozen years ago now, and it's not yet in clinical trials due to various pressures. And also we need to proceed carefully. And the, the final part point that I want to make about proceeding carefully comes back to how our clinical trials work. Um, as we said, preclinical data is animals, and then you have phase one, phase two, phase three studies with increasing numbers of people. And the studies are very, very expensive, particularly as you get to a lot of people being involved on the order of thousands for common clinical trials. And in thinking about thousands of people, a lot of people being involved in these trials as subjects, we do not have an infinite supply of people with spinal cord injury for doing clinical trials. Um, every year in the US, they're an average, uh, it's close to like 18,000 new SCI, uh, new people with new SCI each year. That's just traumatic SCI. Um, but of those, how many could be participating in research studies? Uh, the point is that we don't have an infinite supply to keep doing research studies, um, especially if they don't have really super duper duper promise. Um, there is promise with this approach I just identified, but as I said, we want to be really careful to get as much as we can right before proceeding into a study and having yet another failed clinical trial. I'm not saying that a ton of clinical trials have failed in the spinal cord injury, but it's not just spinal cord injury that has this issue of lack of replication or a challenge of advancing findings. In the stroke literature, most trials also fail. It's over, I think it's over 90%. Most trials also fail. So really that just takes me back to the point of for various reasons, we don't have an infinite um, financial supply to run research. We don't have an infinite supply of research subjects. Uh, we do need to proceed carefully to do our best, to do the best we can to get it right before we have a treatment that goes into humans. And if you have a countering perspective, I'm really happy to entertain it. Well, you know, I have to say congratulations on that outstanding work. And when I look at that picture, I'm just really in awe that that even occurred. Now, some people will say, well, it was only that one little nerve that put through, but you know, it was, it was one nerve that did it. And sometimes that's, you know, that's the start. And also I'd like to thank you for your caution because, you know, you don't want to cure a spinal cord injury only to develop cancer and die from that, you know? So all these things have to, you know, the more, you know, the more you find out, it seems like the more doors of issues open up in research. It's like you, you think, oh, we finally figured out this part. Oh, wait a minute. Now we've got these 12 other things that we didn't know happen. And so right. this is really wonderful work and it's very promising work. And so we'll look forward to that, uh, more of this in the future, because I'm quite sure you'll figure out, figure out what's going on there. So if I want to add just... that this is work that I did in graduate school, but I'm not chasing this work so much anymore. If people are interested, um, you could look up the Reeve Irvine Research Center uh, for where Oz Stewart is director. And also, um, Ji Geng He, I don't know if he has a, a representative, um, but I'm guessing people could find a way to learn more about him online and try to uh, connect, for instance. Yeah, yeah, because this is really fascinating. And I, I will tell you, I don't know, I don't know this researcher personally, 
But I will tell you that uh, most researchers love to hear from people from the community and what their thoughts are because they're in their lab, they're working, and they really want to hear from people from the community. So, you know, even if you send them an email and say, thank you for your work, you know, it, you know, that really helps spur things along. Or if you have a question or if you have a thought, you know, they, they love to hear from people who are uh, living the situation. Um, we're going to have to jump ahead and answer some questions because our, our time is running out. Um, there is a question from someone who um, oh, wants to know about neuroplasticity in the brain and does it work in the brain and also in the spinal cord? Great question. So I gave an oversimplification that the spinal cord is just a conduit between the brain and the body, body and the brain, and it's a relay system. In addition, the spinal cord is more like a miniature brain. It has its own processing. It has neuroplasticity within the spinal cord and circuitry can change. There's even circuitry locally within the spinal cord. One of these concepts is called a, a central pattern generator that's used for walking. Um, so for instance, in some cats, they can have spinal cord injury, but then below the injury, the circuitry for walking is still intact. And so they can be put in a treadmill and still walk. It may not look very pretty, but the walking is there. Um, and this has been shown to an extent in humans, even after SCI as well. So the spinal cord is like sort of smart. It's not as smart as your full brain, but there's certainly neuroplasticity and changes in circuitry that happen, including after spinal cord injury. A big barrier is trying to get information past that lesion. Um, and it, I'll, I'll just take a brief aside to address that concept. One concept for an approach is to use regeneration intrinsically, like what I was showing with our P10 story. Another approach is to go around the lesion. So trying to bridge across and around it or introducing um, an additional neural substrate to create a bridge so neurons can grow past and around the lesion. And another approach is something like using a brain machine interface. Um, Gregoire Cortine in, in Switzerland, um, he has different mechanisms, one of them of which includes having an implant go to the brain and then being able to control or have um, input going to the spinal cord, therefore bypassing that lesion. It's a, a neural prosthesis, so to speak. Anyway, those are three approaches to try to get past this issue of the spinal cord lesion blocking signals going from the brain to the rest of the body. So there was a question about neural prosthesis. So mm. you just answered, thank you. That was good. We have a couple more questions. Um, what, what would you list as the top 10 clinical trials for people with SCI over one year of injury, Asia A in the cervical region? Oh man, Asia. that is way too detailed for me. But I would start trying to answer that question by searching through one of those two sites, uh, SCI Trials Finder and S, what, SCITrials.org, um, those two websites that I referred to earlier, um, entering in the information that is relevant for you, level of injury, duration of injury, et cetera, and then searching through what clinical trials exist uh, in close enough travel distance to yourself and seeing what options are out there. Um, it's I, I don't know what the top 10 would be out of that. Then if you had an inclination, um, you might learn about these trials and then do a, a literature search by reviews to see what is the promise out of what this trial is um, based on. So are they using an approach like hypothermia? Is this approach of a new medication? Is this an approach of a um, brain machine interface or robotics or something like that? That is an excellent answer because that, that was really a, a very precise question. And since we don't know that the person who wrote in, it's kind of hard to be
be very specific, but that is an excellent answer for everyone to figure out how to do that. Um, we have somebody who wants to know what they should uh, request, how they should talk to their physician uh, to get different kinds of treatments and what's going on and how they can, what should, what, should, what questions should they ask? Hmm. Um, that's, that's a little hard to talk about in generalities. Um, I think if you have your physician, you can, uh, hopefully you have a good relationship with that doctor and you can communicate with that doctor fairly easily. Um, I did have a thought and I'm not, I don't know if this is really answering the question or not, but uh, something we didn't get into today is about using artificial intelligence and AI. Um, and sometimes AI can be really useful in generating text for you, such as if this was a question more about trying to get insurance coverage for something as opposed to just speaking to your doctor. Um, it is possible for physicians included to ask AI to draft a letter um, to yield insurance approval for some durable medical equipment. And AI can be particularly good in doing repeated tasks quickly like that, so it saves a lot of time. And it can learn, at least over time, what is more promising to be approved in the future. So that may be, you know, sci-fi last year, but that's becoming to be more of a reality currently and in coming months, if that. Well, and now this this is going to be a, a question for me. And you talk about you talked about the brain uh, computer interface. You talked about neural prosthesis. Would you consider a neural prosthesis AI? Well, my question so is... Neural processes generally do use artificial intelligence. And okay. this is uh, a way that Gregor Curtin has been able to get smoother walking so quickly is by using AI. Um, AI has different types of use. The easy one to go to is ChatGPT um, based on large language algorithms. And it's fed language like by text and it can give you text answers back and interpretation but ai can also be fed images and generate images for you uh, you can also feed it things like ekgs we've used robotic or computer analysis of ekgs for at least over a decade if not two um, and so the types of input that can be given to AI are growing and the sophistication of analysis that AI can do is growing. So in terms of neuroprostheses, um, there are signals and recordings that are taken in by AI, which AI can then make adjustments to try to amplify or get specific yields of those signals which are correlated to walking. And that's my very superficial explanation. Um, but basically, AI is already being used in these things. And it's been used for a decade plus, even though it hasn't been in super prominence until recently. Right. Everybody, everybody is all intrigued with AI, but we've been using it for a long time. I, yeah. There's two more questions. Sure. Um, I, we'll have to be kind of brief because we are running out of time. Um, mm -hmm. Can anything be found on autopsy for on individuals who have spinal cord injury for nerve regeneration? Hmm. Can anything be found on autopsy for nerve regeneration? Um, so I'm not quite sure what the question is asking, but I'm going to take a give an answer or response anyway with nerve regeneration in the peripheral system i i guess it would be more akin to looking at uh, animal experiments and what things look like after regeneration um and i showed an image of tracing one axon that had regenerated through lesion 
we don't have that same type of approach for autopsies with humans. I have heard of at least one clinical trial that may be using stem cells and the stem cells may be traceable, um, maybe even with using imaging. And so I don't know about specifically for autopsy, but I think there is going to be a way to trace where cells are going, including with regeneration. And that's uh, a hot topic in development currently, so it seems. Well, I have to say I was luck. Well, I shouldn't say I was lucky enough. I guess I, well, that was poor choice of words, but I did participate in a study where people donated their spinal cords after um, death to look for such things. But we had such, talking about your ebb and flow of research, we had such a small sample because, you know, it, it's, it's difficult for people to donate their spines after you know, depending on where you are and what's going on. And so we ended up with a number of three that we studied. So it was a very, very small little study, but it was interesting nonetheless, because mm -hmm. we do know that the nervous system does enjoy regenerating itself. So it's kind of a, you know, kind of an odd question, but I'm glad they asked it. So um, one, since you are a practicing uh, spinal cord injury physician, I, there is one clinical question. This is going to be um, really in a using a different part of your brain <laughs> than the research. But the question is, um, what do you do uh, when you get in your chair and you get looked up, up and looked at up and down? So people who are staring and people who are inquisitive, what do you suggest that people do who are uncomfortable with the looks of others? Oh, you know, my first response was just going to be smile back. Um, yeah. But I, I am not in a chair to be in that same perspective. So I would ask what other people do who are in that similar scenario. Um, me personally, I... As I said, I would sm smile back, crack jokes, be a wise um, person. Um, I don't know beyond that. Well, you know, Whatever actually, makes someone comfortable would be fair game, I think. Yeah, I actually, I, I think that is the answer um, because I, a lot of people will tell me about that, you know, and usually when they respond back to the person, smile or, or be friendly. You know, it's usually not that they're looking at you like, Hey, what's your problem? It's not anything like that. They're just inquisitive and they want to know, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder what happened. I, you know, I wonder how you're doing. They're really not looking at you in a negative sort of way. They're really just wondering what the situation is because it's foreign to them. And yeah. for those of us who are not in chairs, you know, we, you know, well, gosh, I, you know, that looks like a, might be difficult or there are challenges, you know, and starting that conversation really helps everybody. It helps or the person maybe the in the other wheelchair. Person is jealous about the cool wheelchair that someone has. Yeah, it could be, it could be, or I'd like to have that to get around a power chair and wouldn't take me so much energy. Who knows, but I've had anyway. other patients tell me that actually. Yeah. Someone with Is walking that right? ability was jealous of someone else's wheelchair. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it happens. So, you know, you just never know. I mean, you know, I, th I think as human beings, we always take everything very personally. And sometimes it's not really personal at all. It's just curiosity that, you know, they're just trying to figure it out and they don't understand. Maybe they've never even seen somebody in a wheelchair before because that happens too. But anyway, we are a little bit past our time. So I wanted to thank you, Dr. Willenberg, and remind our audience, look for Dr. Willenberg in the future because look at all the things that he's doing. So this is the future of, of uh, paralysis research right here. And I want to thank you very much. It's been very informative and quite delightful, as I knew it would be. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks very much, Linda. Thank you, everyone.